while we had seen a few uh, mute swans on the Thames previously, this is where they all were. The, the queen swans, of course, she, they're protected. Um, there were tons of them. So they were just coming parading past our boat. And as they get toward our boat, they've just, uh, in these files, they just, uh, divvy themselves in half and half of them would go on, uh, port side and half would go on, uh, uh, starboard side. And it was just amazing. They didn't seem to be worried about our canoe at all, but, uh, it's quite incredible to be on the water with them. Episode 313, a 250 mile paddle of England's river Thames with Krista Holling. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hello again, and welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Kurt here. I have Krista Holling with us, and she has a wonderful adventure to share. Two years ago, 2015, she and Glenn Chilton went from the source to the sea on the River Thames, which sounds really fun. Krista lives in Toronto, Canada, grew up in that area, and she is a veterinarian. Glenn is an ornithologist, so a bird biologist. And they thoroughly enjoyed their trip from source to sea on the Thames, and I'm excited to hear about this. So this is about canoeing, it's about sea kayaking, it's about adventure travel, and Krista, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Kurt. I'm excited to be on your podcast. Uh, It's our pleasure. You know, I love this idea of seeing another country from the water, the way that, that you and Glenn did. And so when you mentioned that this was an adventure you're willing to share, I was really excited about this. We have a lot of listeners out there who love adventure travel, a lot who love paddling, whether it's kayaking or canoeing, and they love water. But I think when you travel through a country on water, you get a different perspective than you would get any other way. So I'm excited to hear about what Great Britain is like from the Thames. That's absolutely a, a indeed a wonderful perspective, and the um, one of the best parts about paddling a river is uh, it's guaranteed to be a downhill trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but sometimes it gets to be a little bit much, too much of a downhill trip, depending on the river. I don't know that much about the Thames upstream. I think a lot of us get this vision of the Thames as it goes through London, right? But what is the river like? Just give us a give us a brief overview. What's it like at the source, and how does it change and develop as you travel on down? Sure. So the Thames is the uh, iconic river you picture uh, seeing in, in photos through central London. But if we back upstream a little bit, um, about 200 miles, it starts at uh, in a farmer's field. It actually is spring-fed, and so most of the year there's no water at the source, and it's in a little village called Kemble, which is a fair bit west and a little bit north of London. And then as it makes its way, uh, about 10 miles later, there's enough water to start paddling. So the first part is quite dry. As you go down, there are about 45 locks in the non-tidal Thames. Before you hit London, there's the last lock at Teddington. And after that, as you head into central London, this is now tidal and it communicates with the North Sea. So you can paddle straight through central London under all of the bridges and uh, out into the estuary and beyond, which is what we did. Oh, really fun. Well, thanks for that overview. Let's come back and kind of do the play-by-play of the trip in a minute. But first, I would like to uh, get just a little bit more of your backstory. You grew up in the Toronto area. How were you introduced to adventure? Well, I've always had an interest in uh, natural history and uh, especially animals, and that would lure me outside. And uh, anything that gets me from A to B human powered. I've always had an interest in, especially, uh, cycling and running. So, um, I got into that at an early age, not, uh, not through genetics. My parents, uh, my, my father's uh, Danish and my mom's from New Zealand. Uh, they didn't do too much in the way of outdoors, but they certainly supported anything that I was interested in doing. And I think Glenn had a similar, uh, upbringing where he always loved the outdoors and was encouraged to do that. Um, and, uh, so yeah, just through my love of animals and love of being outdoors and uh, especially anything that would get me on the water, in the water, or under the water, I was interested in. 
So in Toronto, we were just saying before we hit record here, Toronto is a big city. And it's a very nice city, too. I love Toronto. But it is quite close to a lot of wilderness and a lot of different types of wilderness as well. Can you give us the setting of Toronto so we can kind of get a feel for where you grew up? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you. Yes, it is quite green here. A lot of the trees are still standing. Toronto is on uh, Lake Ontario in the eastern part of Canada. And uh, Lake Ontario, certainly if you're on the shore, it uh, could look to be an ocean. It's, um, it is quite vast. You cannot see the other side, which would get you to uh, New York in the United States. Um, it's got a population of about 5 million people and counting, and uh, it is quite uh, suburban, so it spreads out a lot in the greater Toronto area. But beyond that, there are many provincial parks and probably 10,000 lakes or so. Um, I think more lakes every year, perhaps, uh, depending on where, where a lake starts and finishes. But so we are quite blessed with a lot of uh, opportunity for weekend warrior adventure or moonlighting adventure, as I like to call it. Sure, you bet. And I know a lot of Canadians are really into canoeing. It's, it's kind of indigenous to Canada, as well as being a fantastic way to see your country. When the water is not solid, uh, it absolutely is. We've got a, a little bit of time in our summer where we can do that. So it's um, certainly something that I think is a, a, a traditional Canadian. And we're very lucky to have a lot of opportunities of uh, flat water around us to go and seek out that type of adventure. So what do you do when the water is solid? I try hard to make friends with winter. I feel like I was perhaps robbed from uh, Tahiti as a young infant. So I've, <laughs> I've tried really tried really hard. Um, ice climbing, snowshoeing, um, downhill skiing, cross-country skiing, all of that's available. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. And failing that, there are there are airplanes uh, that can take one away from winter, so we have that as an option too. Oh yeah, well Toronto, being in Canada, it's it's in the southern part of Canada, right? But climate wise, uh, what's it like? Uh, fairly similar to um, Chicago, for those who are familiar with Chicago or from that area, we get. Um, a lot of sun, I will say that. I'm thankful to that. We have um, four seasons, and they're they're quite obvious, discernible seasons. Uh, um, winter lasts until March, or I'd say almost almost April, till we get into the spring, which is um, wonderful. And then we have hot, hazy, humid days through June, July, and August. And then um, in September, things cool off, but we're blessed with uh, lovely color changes on the uh, deciduous trees here. And then um, it's just fall is beautiful. It's what comes after fall that I always uh, dread a little bit. Uh, our winters start in November. It tends to get a bit gray and, and quite cold pretty quickly. And we see a fair bit of snow generally through um, late December until early to mid-March. So how cold is cold there? Um, minus 10 to minus 20 Celsius, which would be zero to 10 Fahrenheit, perhaps. Yeah. So at the, that's solid. You know, that's solid cold, but that's not your 40 to 50 below cold that people might think of when they think of Alaska or northern Canada. So your climate is quite temperate, really, comparatively. We can absolutely do uh, things outdoors if we're dressed appropriately, for sure. We don't have a huge risk of, uh, of frostbite, and there certainly are colder places on the planet, definitely. And, and it's not minus 20 every day through. It can hover around uh, zero on one side or the other, usually, usually on the negative side of zero Celsius. Right, right. So right around the freezing point. And that's kind of fun, though. I, I love the weather that develops at those temperatures. Because uh, you get the beautiful fogs, you get some of the icy, beautiful formation, the hoarfrost and stuff that, that can form. But then you also get the snowstorms that are lovely as well. And it's just so nice when the climate can, can kind of dance around freezing point. I don't know oh, if definitely. you share that, but I think it's beautiful. Well, it certainly brings an extra appreciation for the seasons that are, that are coming after winter, I will say that. And uh, yeah, definitely um, the silence that develops when you've got a blanket of snow on the ground and on the leaves is uh, quite beautiful. There's not much else like it. Mm, yeah. And I have to ask you about your veterinarian career a little bit, because I think so many people, especially as kids, are like, oh, I want to do that. And it sounds like a really adventurous lifestyle. Um, how did you get into it? And has it proven to be adventurous for you? Oh, uh, thanks. It's a lot of fun and very rewarding. I got into it the uh, the standard way uh, through through schooling. <laughs> um, 
and uh, University of Guelph is uh, my veterinary degree, and then that will get you um, a doctor of veterinary medicine, and from there you can certainly do general practice, uh, or you can go on to some advanced training, and I was interested in small animal surgery, so uh, from there I went to Colorado for an internship, and then uh, the University of Florida for a three-year surgical residency, and then I came back and taught at the veterinary school at uh, the University of Guelph for a few years and then went into private practice. Um, so my day consists of uh, essentially putting dogs and gats back together, I guess is how I can summarize <laughs> it. Uh, at the end of the day, I like to have all body parts uh, accounted for and pointing in the right direction. Um, and we also do a fair bit of wildlife. I've got a, a lot of interest in that and some connections with uh, some wonderful wildlife veterinarians in the area. So we do a fair bit of um, pro bono work for that. You know, there are a lot of people that love the idea of working with animals for a career because, let's face it, humans love animals. We love our pets. We love to see wildlife. Um, what's it like to work with animals regularly? Oh, uh, it's wonderful. I mean, certainly from an emotional standpoint, we're not always seeing them when they're at their healthiest, just by definition of of the job. And so uh, there has to be a little bit of a emotional preparedness for that and uh, the family members that are bringing them in. But generally, certainly along the lines of uh, surgery, I'm very lucky that things tend to, tend to work out very well and are very rewarding from that standpoint. And uh, we're very fortunate that animals do play such an important role in people's uh, families and day-to-day -day lives, that they will come and seek out this sort of advanced care for them. Mm. Well, I just wanted to get that perspective because um, I think it's it's a beautiful career that you've, that you've chosen, and I think that's a lot of fun. But let's go back over the pond. We have to get back to the UK now. We've already described what the trip was, but let's talk about the, the reason behind the trip. So why did you decide to do this? It wasn't just for the trip itself. No, why the, why the River Thames? Um, and I will say a little asterisk after River Thames. In Ontario, Canada, there is the Thames River um, that also flows through London, but London, Ontario. So the River Thames is uh, in England. And we picked that. Um, we were bouncing around some trips that we could bite off. Um, we both work full time, so that we could bite off in about two to three weeks, uh, start to finish. And that had um, was likely doable, but would be, be hard work and would be in an area that would allow us to uh, travel and just see more, see more landscape, see more of this wonderful world. And the Thames has such an amazing history. Glenn's family is from England, so he was quite partial to doing something in the UK. And we were looking at uh, perhaps either cycling or paddling. And, and that's where we toned in on the River Thames. It's uh, the longest river that is fully in England. The River Severn is longer than Thames, and it's the longest one in the UK, but it it starts beyond England. And so uh, from that standpoint, there's a lot of history in the Thames. And as you know, it is iconic as it goes through central London. Um, and what was uh, another part that's great about it is the entire Thames is navigable by a small craft, with the exception of the part that's underground and so the first uh, 17 kilometers 10 miles is uh, dry land but you can you can still walk it there is the Thames path that goes from the source all the way along and follows the Thames so for those interested in the river and seeing seeing England and covering about three to four hundred kilometers um, you can actually walk it if you're more of a hiker or a randonneur. And so you did this trip in April and May um, so a, a springtime trip was the season good? Was that the right time to do it? For us, it was. Um, we wanted to make sure we didn't perhaps have it to be too cold or too much rain. And we thought uh, if we picked a bit of a shoulder, shoulder season where the uh, tourist levels are a little bit lower, then that would probably be an ideal time. We also wanted to make the trip uh, tailored toward uh, presentations to school children along that are at schools along the Thames so we could try to inspire them to go in and have their own outdoor adventures we thought if we catch them early in life between the ages of five and twelve for our audience and so we set that up and we therefore wanted the trip to be while well, uh, the kids are still in school and so that worked out how many times did you get to speak we went to five schools uh one in Ontario 
before we left and then uh, four more just along the Thames. So we probably spoke to about 2,000 to 2,500 students. Oh, that's wonderful. So what kind of a response did you get when you talked to the children about uh, boating down the Thames? And we should tell people you started in a canoe and then when you got to the tidal part of the Thames, you switched to a sea kayak, but you were paddling the, the length of the Thames. So what was the response from the, from the students? Oh, it was wonderful. Everyone in England is uh, incredibly uh, fabulous to deal with, and we're very helpful for our trip. So the um, the response changed a little bit because, of, of course, our, the story that we gave to the students changed a bit um, as we were literally stopping in. There's, these were pre-planned, but we'd stop into schools along the way. So the first one was at the uh, Kemble primary school. And that was actually the day before we had arrived in Kemble. We were starting the trip the next day. So we didn't have much of a story of how our trip was going yet. We talked about the uh, all the, the, the gear that we needed, what brought us to England, uh, the fabulous history of the Thames, and a little bit more information about where it starts and finishes for the kids, and um, that we were going to be on our way. And of course, they were interested in following us through our social media connections that we were then going to have. But as we went along with each school that we stopped in at, we had some more stories that we had gathered from uh, the real life adventure. Now we've, we're a bit further along the movie, so to speak. Right. And, um, we had a, a, a mascot named Alfred, who is a uh, stuffed uh, a plush, not taxidermied, but a, a plush a kingfisher that was custom made for us from someone on Etsy in Holland. And we wanted to have a little uh, mascot animal with us just to make the trip a little bit more fun. And common kingfishers are found quite commonly along the Thames. They have a beautiful blue, yellow, and orange color to them. So we had this lovely... Uh, foot and a bit tall, say standing maybe 15 inch tall kingfisher bird who had a little emblem with the logo of our trip on him. And he had his little backpack and he had a little, a life preserver. So he came along and he was attached to our backpack as we were doing the, uh, the portage or the first part or portage, as you say. And, uh, then in the boat, he was attached to the front of the canoe and then the deck of the kayak. So he he came along and got rained on when we got rained on and got sunned on when we got uh, the sun shining down on us. And he spoke to the kids as well. So did the kids really connect with that character? That's fun. They, they passed Alfred around the class and loved it. And uh, they asked wonderful questions. So that was a, a, a real treat for us. And of course, we, we won't know if any of our presentations inspired anyone. But we went to schools. Uh, we intentionally picked schools in um, less uh, advantaged neighborhoods, to, uh, hoping that we can maybe inspire even one of those uh, kids to, to get out there and, um, and uh, stay in school and have wonderful adventures while they're doing it. Oh, that's fun. That's great. And I have to point out, Krista, uh, Glenn, being an ornithologist, you're a veterinarian, um, two animal-focused people going down the Thames. Did you have many encounters with wildlife? Oh, we certainly did, Kurt. It was amazing. For most of it, I had pictured that there would be lots of other boats with us on the Thames as we went along, and um, and uh, pubs and bistros and cafes all, all along uh, the entire trip. And in fact, a lot of it is more wilderness with just fields on either side of us. So we were... Um, we're the only boat essentially that we had seen in terms of a uh, small craft. There was uh, perhaps two other canoes at one point that we saw, but we're the only one doing the entire Thames uh, as far as we knew. And there were some long boats that came along, but in terms of the wildlife, there was the kingfishers that I had mentioned, and then a lot of waterfowl. And I'm a huge uh, duck and goose uh, enthusiast. I, I have a few pets along those lines. And so um, for me, I was in, I was in heaven and uh, they came over to see what treats we might have in our boat. Um, there are some voles along the side, so small mammals along the side of the Thames. We didn't actually get to see them, but we had arranged to meet with a vole uh, biologist, and then just from a timing standpoint, that didn't end up happening. But uh, there were a few other little meetings that uh, we had pre-set up to um, just chat with two individuals that either are involved in the history or the natural history along the Thames. That was a lot of fun. Mm, that's fun. You know, my son and I each got a copy of Birds of Colorado this spring, and we decided we would see how many we could spot by the time, you know, the year was over. And so we've been checking off. And, but every time I see a bird and I'm not sure, I refuse to check it off because I want to make sure for sure that I've, you know, I've seen the bird that goes with, you know, the bird that's in the book. And that's kind of been a, a fun thing. It's not a, a primary focus of ours. 
But what's been really fun about it is when we're mountain biking or when we're hiking or even just driving down the road, it gives us something to watch for. And uh, it's been kind of a blast. So I'm sure having Glenn along as an ornithologist, uh, he was probably pointing out all kinds of things. Oh, it was fabulous. And Glenn is very much a stop and smell the the flowers sort of person. So from that standpoint, neither of us were interested in in racing down the Thames and not seeing what was beside us. And that's why we intentionally had planned these stops and we're looking out for things. But uh, yeah, it, he does a lot of bird behavior as well. So um, I had tons of questions and I really enjoyed picking his brain about all of that. It was a, a lot of fun. I had a, a personal guide in the boat, uh, as it were. Um, and I think for you, uh, bird watching is fabulous because, as you said, it does uh, add an additional dimension to the cycling or other uh, form of sport that you're doing. But again, from a stop and smell the flowers standpoint, uh, you're actually just paying attention to the small details of the area that you're in. And really, if you just stand still for a second and watch the animals or look around, there's really a, a whole lot to observe in front of you. We also saw some mandarin ducks, which are introduced. They're Asian. They're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they must have been introduced and they were around uh, the Richmond area. But um, they'd obviously done quite well there and uh, it was a, a lot of fun certainly to look at the ducks and geese. Oh yeah. I always encourage people to to uh, encounter nature through adventure sports. I, for me, adventure is part of the equation. The sport, meaning you're out there getting healthier, doing something active, that's part of the equation. Another part of the equation is connecting with nature because we do adventure sports outside. And I believe that as people connect with nature, it is so valuable. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's really neat that you set up these visits to the schools because you could help the, the students there to kind of wake up to the nature that's around them. I think that's really fun. And so for us, you know, being able to check off, hey, we, we did see that bird. You know, I've spent 20 years in this area and never realized that this bird is here. And now I've seen it. And that's something new. And like you said, it wakes you up to what's going on in nature. Some of the smaller things that you might miss if you didn't have your peepers open, right? Oh, exactly. And uh, Glenn, during his part of the talk, he suggested to the kids that even if they ask their parents to go to the local library and check out a book on on uh, birds of England or birds of southern England and get their little backpack and just head out there and just just start looking and start appreciating. Um, and we mentioned to them, you know, we've certainly come a part of the way across the world, or in his case, uh, halfway across the world to to do their river. But for them, this is in their backyard and they don't have to start with crazy big adventures. We talked about the small adventures that we would each have as uh, as children and, and how that grew over time. So just start small, but um, you can really put the label of adventure onto many, many forms of uh, experiences, and that's the nice thing about it. Fall is the best time to start thinking snow, and Bentgate Mountaineering is ready to help you get prepared for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in alpine touring, telemark, NTN, and splitboarding gear. Brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear from beacons to airbags, and they are ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. You can also rent skis, boots, split boards, beacons, shovels, and probes at Bentgate. What's more, they host free demo ski days at local resorts so you can try out the latest gear. Stop by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado, or go to bentgate.com to check out your new gear as well as to get updates on all of their events. Did you camp along the way, or were you staying in available lodging along the way? How wild is the Thames, I guess? That would be the question. Well, we both love camping, so we had considered that when we were looking at the logistics. We started preparing about a year and a half before the actual uh, trip. 
The issue with camping, we elected to to do uh, bed and breakfasts, is that, um, of course, that adds to the amount of gear that we're bringing with us, and we're trying to be a little bit on the lighter side. But from a logistical standpoint, um, there is a wild areas of the Thames in between villages and towns, but not a lot. And once we get uh, closer to London area, it probably might by definition end up being a bit of suburbia. So we just weren't too sure what our camping opportunities would be. And um, the nice thing was with bed and breakfast, again, we wanted to engage with the locals and they're often family owned. And then we could chat with the owner and get some, get some stories there. So we quite like the idea of the interactions that would come with uh, those sort of accommodations. Well, what a unique way to see the United Kingdom. I, I think it's really cool. Or I guess the Great Britain part, what were some highlights? Let's let's go down this road. What surprised you that you didn't expect? From a highlight standpoint or a uh, unwelcome surprise standpoint? <laughs> well, we can do there, both. There both. How about a happy surprise first? Okay. Um, we had a we had a few. One one that was a a small surprise and then a bigger surprise along the Thames. I mentioned there are quite a few locks, uh, about four dozen of them, as we go along, and Generally, those are uh, either manual, where you have to physically turn a big wheel yourself, or automatic, where you press a button and and make the lock system work. Sometimes there are lock keepers there to guide you through, and other times uh, we had to do it ourselves. So that was a, a nice change to learn how locks work. But at one point early on, there was a canoe bypass option, in that if you were in a small craft and did not want to go through the entire lock system, there's... Um, Essentially, it was a, a, a big water slide for your boat, and it would t- take you down, and this is perhaps a, a 15 feet, vertical feet uh, difference generally between the upper part of the lock and, and where it comes out. So we decided we'll take that. Oh, my goodness, that was the funnest thing ever. It uh, shoots you down pretty <laughs> pretty quickly. Instead of being a straight slide like a, a log ride, they decided to um, be a little, more, a little bit more creative during that distance, and they did uh, some switchbacks. <laughs> and then to make it uh, look rather nice, it was landscaped with boulders on, on both sides. So there'd be some plants and some big boulders and such along the side. So it was a very nice-looking stream. But it went – the water flow may not have been white water, but it was swift water, and it went very quickly and then – kept changing kept changing direction so for a long tripping canoe that's uh, loaded down you really had to quickly uh, pry or back paddle to kind of change directions as you're scooting along so apart from the fact it was a little tricky to go that quickly around those tight corners that was uh, incredibly fun but that was the only canoe bypass that they had the other 44 locks did not have one to our disappointment um, wow. but if you if you're on the Thames and see the canoe bypass i encourage you to take it you you will even want to i think climb back up and and try it again um, the the longer surprise we had was one day uh, it was one of our longer mileage days so perhaps uh, 30 30 plus miles so 50 kilometers or so we were ending in Oxford, and we had um, our accommodations were at uh, a hotel and an inn, and uh, adjacent to a pub that was right on the Thames. And in Oxford, the Thames is called the Isis, so it was right on the Isis, and um, so we wouldn't have to portage our canoe very far for that. But we were running out of time, and it was starting to get dark, and we were deciding: do we keep going? Do we tie the canoe up and? grab a cab to our accommodations and come back for it. And we decided to keep going. So we ended up getting into Oxford well after dark, but we had little headlamps and we put those on. And um, that was just a, a complete blessing that it worked out that way because we got to see as we turned the corner and went into the city of Oxford, there were bridges over Oxford and the, the number of pubs and bistros that are along there was fantastic. And it was a, a nice, um, um, nice weather in late April, and a lot of people were just sitting sitting by the river as we went by. So we got to see Oxford illuminated at night, and mm. uh, and then enter it, and then paddle literally paddle right up to our hotel. Well, that's fun. I was going to ask what you did with your canoe when you would go into uh, your accommodations. Yeah, we we sort of wondered that too in advance because not all of the hotels or B and Bs necessarily could accommodate a hotel uh, uh, canoe, and not all of them were right on the Thames. Um, so we brought along a, uh, I'm so thankful of this, a long 
cable lock that is designed, uh, I think, for securing kayaks to the roof of your car when you've got them on racks. So it's um, probably five feet long or so. So we had that, and it was just a little combination lock. So a few times we would just uh, secure the canoe to whatever we found. It would be a, a fence pole on a field or it would be a picnic table or something like that and just really hope that it would be there the next day. Um, in some occasions, we had checked in advance to see where the nearest canoe or kayak club was because, of course, those are uh, – or rowing club, those are all along the Thames. And if we found one that was pretty close to our – B and B, then we had notified them in advance and asked, could we store our canoe there? And they were incredibly gracious about it. We didn't have anyone say no. Well, it sounds like a really lovely trip. You first went through the the part of the Thames that had the current and the locks, but then you got to the tidal Thames. Explain to the audience what the difference is. So the non-tidal Thames, and this is the first um, maybe 150 kilometers or so, uh, 75, 80 miles maybe, is. Um, has locks. And so for that reason, they're trying to control the, the, the speed at which the river flows. And um, as you get to each lock, you've got to operate it, as I had mentioned, and, and get through. And then before hitting London at Teddington, that's the last lock. So now any water beyond that not only has a, a current, which the non-tidal Thames also has, but it has a uh, tidal influence. And so it's attached to the North Sea. And so there will be high tides and there will be low tides. And as you go through central London, the city itself is built is built up. It's higher than the Thames, I think, for, for flooding reasons and for historical reasons. It's higher than the Thames. So if you're in London walking around and you walk across the Thames, you don't have to walk upstairs to cross the bridge and to go down again it's at it's at street level if that makes sense so sure. conversely when you're in the thames you're you're below the street um, by a fair bit depending on the tidal influence and there's um about a seven meter so maybe 25 foot difference um in between low tide and high tide generally so that's uh that's pretty significant for something that is uh squished between city walls oh, and yeah. so so not only did we have the the, the current that was going t- toward the sea but we also had now the tide coming in and out and there's a lot of uh a lot of uh commercial boat traffic that was uh much bigger than our two-person kayak that we had to be fairly cautious of so the the tidal thames around london itself can be quite hazardous uh if you're if you're paddling well you switched from the canoe to the sea kayak which but it was a tandem, right? That's correct, yeah. And uh, was that good? Are you glad you made that switch when you got to the tidal Thames? Oh, completely. That would have been, I think, quite tricky as much as, as attached as we were to our canoe that had now done the uh, the entire portage. I'll tell you about that in, in a little bit, the 10-mile trip uh, until we got to water. Um, and then all of, the, all of the locks, we were sad to part with our canoe, but I think we really would have had a tricky time because... The trip didn't end in London. We continued out through the Thames estuary and the the Thames barrier systems and around uh, uh, across um, the north coast of Kent to um, to the Channel. And so that would have been quite tricky, I think, in a an open canoe, just in terms of the influence that the wind would have been able to have on it. And um, so I'm very pleased that we switched up to a tandem kayak. We had located. Um, online a wonderful paddler named Harry Whelan who has a a record for circumnavigating Great Britain with a a couple of his friends and he's paddled in the London Thames region for many many years so we actually used him as a guide the London Port of London uh, Authority suggests having a guide as you go through the the tidal Thames and also uh, through London at least and also letting them know that uh, that you're coming so they can sort of watch out for you a little bit. So it sounds like a delightful trip. And you mentioned something about the the long portage before the Thames becomes navigable by canoe. What was that story? Well, the as I mentioned, the Thames is a source or spring fed. And so at the source, it's usually dry. There's a, a pile of rocks and a big sign that uh, indicates you're at the source of the Thames. But really, you're in a farmer's field and you could see uh, maybe a slightly beaten path where some folks have, have walked and there's a little bit less grass, but there's no sign of water there. So we went a year before the trip. Glenn and I traveled to England to try to find the source because we wanted to make sure if we're going to show up there with our, our boat and all of our gear that we can find it okay. Um, as it is, there's um, 
the head of the Thames Inn is the closest uh, commercial building in the area. And it's got a bit of a, a map at the front. It's a satellite view of where the inn is and where the start of the Thames is. And so we took a picture of that and tried to follow that. And you have to go um, over some train tracks and over a barbed wire fence and such and through some cows. And, and then you get to the source of the Thames. So we didn't, it, but it doesn't get deep enough to paddle. In fact, water does not start trickling in for a few miles for, for 10 miles but we didn't want to miss the first 10 miles. We wanted to do the entire Thames. So we showed up with our canoe and three weeks worth of gear at the start and mm. a small, uh, a small trailer, which is just two little wheels that are, uh, I think it's designed to take your canoe perhaps from your, your car to, to the put in point. But uh, no, for us, we were using this for 10 miles. And these are farmers fields. So uh, in the UK, a Thames, path, for instance, you can certainly trespass on farmers' uh, property if you're using it for the, the purpose of that path. So, and path is a loose loose term. This is, again, you can just barely see where, where you're supposed to be trekking. So as we go along there, to keep production animals in, there would be fences from between one <laughs> field and the next. And they're about four feet tall because sheep are roaming. And um, they had a small gate where a, a little uh, hiker could get through, but a, a canoe cannot fit through that. So each time we came across a fence, we had to unload the canoe, pick up the canoe, hoist it over the fence, load it again, and continue on. And what we noticed was uh, as we're pushing it, so that was one obstacle, but the weight of our gear, because the canoe is now on land just being supported by by one point, by these two wheels, um, was pushing pushing down. It wasn't we didn't have the buoyancy to help disperse the weight. So it was all pushing down where it attached to these wheels. And at one point Glenn it was pretty tricky and Glenn said, What's that sound? And he looked and we had actually distorted the uh the the floor of the canoe was now distorted and pressing on the wheels. So we were actually acting as our own brake. Oh no. And uh <laughs> oh this was taking us forever. So we had to take everything off and readjust everything and put it back on. And these 10 miles we thought would take us, we gave it a day, but we said, oh, we'll, we'll be in Crick Lade uh, by lunch. Well, no, this is now late in the day, and we're still, I think we've done maybe three miles, so about five kilometers, mm. and we had, a, we had another seven miles to go. So I flagged down um, a taxi who managed to, I convinced him to pick us up at middle of nowhere and nowhere, and he, he and, and uh, our gear and I went to Crick Lade where the hotel was waiting and put our gear there. And then I got him to wait for a second and take me back to where Glenn was standing with the canoe so we could continue with an empty canoe. And, uh, <laughs> and that, that, that's how we did it, but still took us a, a day and a half. So we didn't even get to, uh, the inn with the canoe that night. Instead, we, um, we managed to, uh, I think we were about four miles away and it was now pitch black. So we, um, we were in a small village with our canoe, but we still had to get to our gear in the hotel that night so we looked in uh in the village that seemed a fairly friendly village and we decided maybe we can ask someone if we can keep our canoe here so we looked around to see whose house looked friendly and who had um a yard big enough that they might say yes to a canoe and then we knocked on their door with our little canadian and australian flags in our hand um and sheepishly asked if uh, we could perhaps store our canoe there and uh, of course we looked like we had just climbed out of a lagoon or something I'm sure. uh, <laughs> right but uh, a lovely gentleman named michael and his family uh took us in he was fantastic he took the canoe in no problem at all and uh and then the next day when we came back to retrieve the canoe he had already sorted through his library and had a whole hoist of books on the thames for us to to give us um which is super kind of him we we had to decline the books because we were already so laden with gear. That was a whole, that was a whole problem. That's why we got stuck in the field. But uh, um, that was very, very kind of him. So the people there are just fabulous. Oh, that's great. Tell us some, uh, some curious historical facts that you learned about the Thames that a lot of people may not know. Sure. Um, well, the history is, I guess, uh, they did have issues with pollution a number of years ago in the uh, environment agency and uh, conservation uh, groups in the greater London area have worked very, very hard to clean up the Thames. So it certainly is not the polluted river that it once was. But uh, of historical interest, we met with a gentleman named Tom Bolton, who is the author of a book called 
London's Lost Rivers, and he took us on uh, a trip to look at underground rivers. So there are actually quite a few that flow into the Thames as little tributaries under London. So if you're a tourist in London walking around, there are a few areas where if you look at, uh, get down and peer through a street grate, you will see water flowing, and those are one of the underground rivers. The largest of that is called the River Fleet, and I guess way back when it was uh, it was a true river, and then it just became fairly polluted. And so when London was uh, built up above to its existing street level that it is right now, the uh, river fleet was was buried, but it, it's still running. And so you can we we traced it. Uh, Tom walked us from one of near the start of it all the way down, uh, and it finishes in the Thames at Blackfriars Bridge. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you wouldn't know had you not um, connected with the local people there to find out. No, exactly. And then in the estuary, there's um, the Thames Barrier, which is a set of perhaps five or six uh, large silver structures that stick out of the, uh, they look a bit uh, futuristic, that stick out of the water. And what they do is they can, they open up, they they flare open a bit like a fan and become a, a barrier from side to side to prevent floods um if there's a risk of flooding from the north sea to london they can use that and in the past few years they have had to close the thames barrier but we we paddled right through and the neat thing is if you're if you're in a boat going through london and going through the estuary when you get to uh, a bridge i think a lot of the main bridges um london bridge tower bridge there are controllers in there that uh you wouldn't know you look up you just see people in cars but uh they're controlling the boat traffic, most of it being commercial, but uh, you do need to communicate with them with a VHF radio and, and you need a license to operate their radio. So we got that in advance. But as we came along, uh, we would say yellow kayak to London Bridge over and, and they would respond and they would tell us under what arch to go. <laughs> That's fun. So they're making sure that traffic doesn't doesn't create a jam or, or a collision of some sort then? Yes, I think, I think collision is uh, their main interest and that, we were certainly happy with that. So what about permits? Did you have to pull permits to do this trip? We did. It was fairly easy, though. Um, but you do need a permit to be on the Thames. It uh, doesn't cost much. I think it was seven or eight pounds, which is um, maybe $10 uh, American and uh, 15 $20 Canadian. And I think it allows you to be on the Thames for 30 days, as I recall. So it was very inexpensive. Uh, so we had that. And then you do need a license to operate a VHF radio, and that you can do, um, and it, it's geographical, so if I have one to operate one in the on Lake Ontario, that doesn't qualify me for, for England. But if you just go, uh, probably if you Google VHF radio license um, England or UK, that'll come up, and it's um, you can do that very easily online, so we didn't have any issues with that. And then the uh, Port of London Authority has a fabulous website with a lot of information, and they'll even send you a, a map of um, the London area, so you can see the Thames that goes through there and the, the bridges and such, and prepare yourself that way. And we communicated with them in advance and with the Environment Agency that regulates the, um, I believe, the non-tidal Thames, and we let them know that we were coming. This episode of the Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by 180TAC.com. 180TAC manufactures premier backpacking and emergency products. Whether you need a backpacking stove for your week-long trek on the trail or an emergency stove for your bug-out bag, we have the tools you need. Visit www.180tack.com. Do you love mountains? You are not alone. Jerry Roach is well known for his extraordinary and detailed guidebook, Colorado 14ers, but did you know that Jerry has written 15 books, including guidebooks to 13ers, Indian Peaks, Rocky Mountain National Park, and more. But he has also written narratives about a lifetime of mountaineering full of Jerry's insights and humor. If you like adventure, then these books are for you. Jerry Roach's books can be purchased at his website, summitsite.com. That's S-U-M-M-I-T-S-I-G-H-T dot com, as well as on Amazon and in bookstores near you.
logistically, it does take a little bit of planning, doesn't it? This isn't just a, hey, let's go do this. This is something you have to work for. It does. And I guess um, it probably depends what you want to get out of it in terms of what you put into it. For us, uh, I mentioned we, we started planning about a year and a half in advance, but we wanted uh, to also involve school presentations. We wanted to also have uh, a blog leading up to that. So Glenn had done a weekly blog for a year and a half leading up to our trip and then on on preparations and logistics and history about the Thames and such each each week he'd uh, have a new writing and then we also wanted to have a, a bit of Facebook and Twitter presence um, just to uh, see if we can inspire others perhaps uh, to do some trips like this or if they're interested in just knowing a little bit more about uh, how one can paddle down the Thames so for us we had that in a just in, in a in a addition to the logistics of finding out, uh, figuring out our itinerary and the accommodations and the permits and, and such, and getting in touch with uh, with Harry to guide us through the central London area. And one more thing we haven't mentioned here. I'm pretty sure that your canoe didn't fit under the seat in front of you with your carry-on luggage on the airplane. No, it didn't. And that was a very sad uh, aspect of the trip because uh, I'm a bit of a gear junkie i love uh, well made outdoor e- equipment and such including including boats and so um commercial airliners will take a boat up to uh, i believe about 8 feet so a small whitewater kayak generally you can go with that but um really hard to disguise a canoe as either a, car- <laughs> a carry on or uh you know saying you're going skiing with a box that big probably wouldn't work so um we did arrange uh, and this is partly why we went went over a year in advance we did arrange uh, to purchase a canoe from um some wonderful outfitters there they had a a bright yellow one we wanted we wanted to be seen so we got a nice bright yellow expedition canoe from there and then uh harry loaned us a tandem sea kayak and then we ended up um we we arranged a few um we were able to get some sponsorships from some lovely uh, outdoor retailers and other manufacturers and we were very very thankful to their assistance with uh with our our project and our trip so on our when our canoe arrived um not every sponsor had uh, decals for us that would be seen on a on a canoe so the the night before our trip we took some colored permanent markers some sharpies and um had a little picture of their logo in front of us and would would write our own little version of it so we were we were drawing their uh, logos on the side of our canoe but um yeah it was sad to part with them in the end and i've since gone on and identified some uh, some pack rafts that I think would be great for future trips because then you can actually take the canoe and uh, take your boat with you rather. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be a good idea. That would be fun. So did you sell the kayak and the canoe in the end or did you just donate it somewhere? The kayak, um, Harry kept cause that was his and he had one to, to loan us. So we appreciated renting that from him. The canoe, um, the sons of a friend of Glenn were uh, interested in it. So, um, so we sold it, so it's still, it is still in England, and it is still on the Thames. And it's still advertising for your sponsors. <laughs> <That's> yes, <great. laughs> I think the sponsorship, uh, at least our versions of their logos are still on there. Yeah, they got their money's worth. That's awesome. Okay, so this is a very unique way, I think, to see Great Britain. Do you have plans to do something similar in other places? Would you recommend it for a, a way to see a place? Oh, absolutely. Uh, with the Thames, there's not white water, so we didn't have to worry... Uh, about getting into trouble that or getting over our heads perhaps with it. So I will say to anyone who's new at paddling and maybe interested in the Thames, you could do the entire Thames as I have described, although you may want to start with just your, your backpack at the source and meet, meet the canoe uh, in Cricklade where there's actually water. Um, that will help with the, the portage for sure. Um, but you could just do the non-tidal if you just want to do the locks a lot of people do that uh, especially in the long boats they go down to teddington and then turn around if you don't want to get into dealing with uh, tides and marine charts and such or if you're a little bit more ambitious then uh, then you could take on the rest of the thames and where the thames ends is a little bit up to you because of course it turns into the sea so it's a bit hard to say there's an exact line at which point it stops uh, for us, we wanted to go uh, around into the channel and down to um, Richborough, where the uh, Romans landed. There's historical uh, significance there. We thought, well, maybe we'll come up. Probably not in the same style as the Romans, but we'd finish there. And as it turned out, the last three days of our trip, we had a 50-mile 
headwind. Um, uh, yeah, so that was going to make it a little bit on the tricky side, and we had a plane to catch, so we couldn't afford to sit and wait out the river, uh, wait out the, the weather, rather. So we finished it in, in Margate, which is um, the northeast corner of Kent, just as it, just where the, uh, the sea turns into the English Channel. So what about this trip do you think was the most adventurous, the, the part that stretched you the most? Definitely the portage. Um, that was tricky. I think just the amount of gear we had in, in the boat with the two trailers and all of the, all of the fences. Um, that was definitely the trickiest part, or at least which twisted our itinerary a little bit because the, uh, with camping, I guess you just camp wherever you are and decide this is it for the day. When you pre-planned your accommodations, we had to be, and, and, and school presentations, we had to be there tonight, there tomorrow, there the next day, there the next day. So um, getting a little bit of a glitch in the schedule certainly affected that, but you roll with it, I guess. That's how adventures are. What do you think was uh, probably the, the best experience of the trip that you had? No doubt talking to the school kids. Those interactions were wonderful. Just uh, their, their young minds and just the way their minds uh, think and the questions they ask and such, which is uh, a lot of fun. And again, if we've inspired any of them, then uh, it certainly made the trip worthwhile. That's funny. I have heard this over and over again. I, I talk to someone about a really neat adventurous trip that they've done, and I say, what was the very best thing that happened? It's almost always the people in one form or another. Right. And so we're talking about canoeing and sea kayaking, the Thames from source to sea, but your favorite part was talking to the students. I love that. And my next favorite part, right up there, but I'd say just second to it, is um, interactions with the waterfowl. There are so many on the Thames, so it would just be us and, uh, and all these ducks and geese and swans. And if you have two seconds for a little story, as we were going along, uh, we were getting close to the city or town of Windsor, which has Windsor Castle, and we knew we'd be approaching it soon, but we didn't realize how it would end up looking. And as it as it turned out, we went around the corner, and there it was. It just presented itself as if curtains had just been drawn, and mm. uh, and there it is announcing itself. We thought we'd just see it in the distance, and it would sort of creep up, uh, approach slowly, and instead it there it was, just magnificent as we went around a corner. And it's there in front of us, perched up tall on a on a hill in Windsor, but right on the bank of the Thames. And um, while we had seen a few uh, mute swans on the Thames previously, this is where they all were. The the queen swans, of course, she, they're protected. Um, there were tons of them, so they were just coming parading past our boat. And as they get toward our boat, they've just uh, in these files, they just uh, divvy themselves in half, and half of them would go on uh, port side, and half would go on uh, uh, starboard side, and it was just amazing. They didn't seem to be worried about our canoe at all, but uh, it's quite incredible to be on the water with them. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, that's really fun. I I love the way that you can encounter wildlife in a boat, in a quiet boat, like a canoe, uh, the, the wildlife, at least where I've done my boating, they're accustomed to people walking in or, or they or cars or maybe motorcycles. But the point is they're not as accustomed to people slipping by on a river. And it's amazing how close that you get to the wildlife and how even when you're close to them, they'll look right at you and not run away. No, that's absolutely true. I've uh, just finished, um, Lovely story about um, an Arctic paddle by uh, Victoria Jason. And she was saying the same thing there, that um, they don't really know what to do when they see a boat, but generally if it's a, a non-motorized uh, vessel, fear is usually not uh, not their first instinct. It's more curiosity. Yeah, yeah. We've drifted by moose and deer, of course, and all sorts of, of birds, eagles. It's just so much fun because they don't get that that start that makes them want to run away. And I like that. I really enjoy being able to see them just relaxed and, and enjoying doing what they're doing. Absolutely. And it's a very respectful way to see wildlife. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's a fun story and I love what you did. I think it's a novel idea. What a great way to see another country. Um, have you studied people's trips in other countries? Do you have some that you would like to do in the future? Oh, absolutely. Your podcast certainly helps with that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah for, for me, I like uh, things that are personally that are point to point where you sort of keep keep going and 
end up somewhere uh, other than where you started. Um, and cycling and paddling are close to my heart. Um, I think cycling, uh, doing some cycling in Iceland and in Denmark um, is probably next on my on my list. My friend and I are talking about that. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, really, really fun. Well, Krista, thank you so much for sharing the detailed trip report on this trip with us. I think it's, a, a like I said, a novel way to see Great Britain. Thank you for sharing that with us and for taking the time to be on the show today. My pleasure, Kurt. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat. Oh, you bet. And for all of our listeners out there, as I always say, until the next show, get out there and have some fun. And what I love about the Adventure Sports Podcast, and I don't mean to toot my own horn, I'm talking about the format of the show, is that we learn so many different ways to get out there and have some fun. And Krista, thank you for sharing this new way with us. Pleasure's all mine, Kurt. Coming up on Monday's episode, Mina Gooley will be here to talk about running the distance of 40 marathons over seven weeks, seven deserts on seven continents to raise awareness for our depleting drinking water situation. Until then, get out and have some fun. 